So worms, <laughs> World Register of Marine Species. Um, in a nutshell, what worms wants to do is it wants to provide an authoritative list of all names of marine species globally ever published. Um, the focus is on accepted names, but um, it's shifting towards synonym syn synonyms too, because uh, we can make the link between the unaccepted and the accepted name, which really helps people when they go through older literature to um, help understand what uh, they're actually talking about. It's not just a name index, but it's expert-based. Um, we have more than 200 taxonomic editors um, involved in worms. Uh, there's one present here, Tim is one of our editors, and Tami <laughs> virtually here uh, also. Um, two, more than 200 people is a very big group, so it was decided that we also need a steering committee, which is elected by all the editors. This is uh, 12 people, and they make the day-to-day -day decisions uh, on worms. Where does worms need to go, what are the priorities, and so on. And next to that, uh, there's also a data management team, which is based here at Flanders Marine Institute. And uh, two of the people of the data management team are actually in the back. There's Wim and Sophie, if you can wave. <laughs> Those are the people behind the info at marinespecies.org email address that we use to um, collect all questions and remarks, both from users and editors that we have. Worms is permanently hosted here at Vlis um, and here to stay in a sense that uh, our institute has committed to keeping worms online no matter what. Um, it's a web-based system. Uh, all of our editors have a login. Uh, they just go to the website, log in, and they can work online um, anytime, night or day. And that's the fun part uh, because our editors are spread worldwide. There's a constant activity on worms. It's a very dynamic system. We follow international standards and that basically comes down to the fact that we follow the codes, the international uh, taxonomic codes. Uh, worms started uh, very small in 2004 uh, within a European project and it started as a European register. In 2007, since the European register was there and was fairly complete, the ID came to uh, develop it further into a world register. And here we are, 2016, uh, still going and uh, becoming more and more complete. Um, just some background information. Um, if we talk about worms, we actually talk about the online interface for the marine species. What is behind worms is the AFIA database or the AFIA platform, which you can see uh, on top. All the information that we have is stored within that AFIA database. And depending on the kind of information it is, it can show up uh, at different levels. So, for example, if it's on uh, cetaceans or polychaetes, so everything grouped on a taxonomic level, it will show up in a global species database. If it is tagged with specific um, distribution information, it can show up in regional species databases. Uh, for example, we have an African one, Canadian, Arctic, Antarctic, European, and so on. So if a species gets tagged with, for example, it appears in the North Sea, then automatically it will show up in the European register. And next to that, we also have thematic species databases, uh, which means that species or taxa are being grouped on a specific theme. And uh, Nick already explained one of those this morning, which is the World Register of Deep Sea Species. So just by tagging a species as uh, being deep sea, it shows up in that specific register. What we also have is a number of externally hosted and managed species databases. Uh, the most uh, famous or familiar ones are probably FishBase and AlgaeBase. We figured there's already people doing a great job for those specific groups, so there's no need for us to duplicate uh, the work and to put uh, effort in that. So we have agreements with those uh, specific databases that we can use their taxonomic content uh, and show it through AFIA and all its uh, related databases. Just to give you an example, how does it work in practice? So within AFIA, the database, we have a specific sponge um, that sponge is marine, so just by being marine, it will show up in the World Register of Marine Species. Um, it's a sponge, so it will show up in the uh, global uh, Porifera database. It has European distributions linked to it, so it will show up in the European Register. 
And in this specific case, uh, it also has invasive information linked to it, so it will show up in our uh, introduced species register. But everything happens on one level, and that's AFIA. All information only gets entered once, and just by the tags and the information, it shows up in different uh, portals. Um, I already mentioned it. Uh, we have a large editorial network. It grew by 50 people since the last slide, apparently. <laughs> There's, there's lots of them. Um, they're spread over more or less 40 countries and 191 institutes worldwide. Um, we're still looking for some more uh, editorial activity within Asia and Africa, but it's, um, it's a little bit more complicated to get people from those regions on board, but we still try, we still want them there. Uh, the worms management happens at different level. So I already mentioned the steering committee, the editors, the data management team, if you go online, um, what you will see on a taxon page is that there are several uh, quality indicators there showing who has been adding what kind of information. So if it comes from one of our editors, it's listed as checked. Um, if it comes from a regional or thematic database, it's trusted. If it comes from other sources, and that's mostly historical, so before we started working on worms, a lot of information came in bulk and was uploaded without actually checking it that information is uh, tagged as unreviewed. Just by having those three quality indicators is a really big help for all our users because they can make a better estimation of which information is more reliable uh, than other. Content-wise, um, AFIA can store a lot of information, a lot more than the taxonomic uh, names and their relationship. There's distribution information, um, specimen data can go in there. Uh, for example, all the type localities of um, your type specimens can be stored uh, within the database. And what we actually do is um, we extract all that uh, type locality information from worms and we send it to OBIS as a database or as a data set. So all the type locality information from worm species that have the information attached is consultable uh, through OBIS. Uh, we also work with vernacular names, uh, ID keys, links, images, and so on. And uh, we're also putting some effort in attributes or ecological traits. Um, for example, saying if a species is benthic or planktonic, saying if a species is deep sea or not, if it's marine or not, um, documenting the body size, uh, documenting whether parts of the skeleton um, are calcareous or not, and so on. Uh, there we go. So for our editors that work on worms, uh, what we say is the minimum information that we need is a species name, the authority and the publication year, and of course the higher classification, because we want to get it in the hierarchy. They need to document the environment, marine, brackish, fresh, terrestrial, or a combination of any of those. And we also ask that they document the status, saying if a species is a recent or fossil, or recent and fossil. Highly desired information, uh, of which some of them are becoming a priority, is, for example, the reference of the original publication. Uh, we hear from a lot of our users that that is the information that they're actually looking for, if you have a species, to also know where that species has been described. Um, also holotype information, um, not only the type locality, but also information on museum collection, where can that specimen actually be found. Um, and then some optional information can be distributions, images, uh, other references, links uh, to other systems, and so on. So where are we now? Um, you can just go to the home page of Worms and at the top right you'll see the statistics. We're currently at 242,000 plus uh, accepted marine species. 96% um, of those are checked, which means that an editor has validated that specific name. We know that there's still a number of gaps to fill. Um, that's a work in progress by all our editors. And we also know that we have to take into account a more or less yearly growth of 1,500 to 2,000 newly described species. So um, I'm saying we're nearing completion, but we're not yet there yet because editors do have to keep up with um, whatever gets published. Um, we have a lot of users, a lot of visitors, a lot of hits per month. Uh, we have uh, people making use of specific web services that we offer. 
and we also have uh, more than 80 institutes that receive a monthly copy of worms, the taxonomic information, which they use in-house to update or maintain their own data systems. Um, I'll skip this, everybody knows. Worms um, is a big data system, but it's not on its own in a sense that um, a couple of years ago it became part of the LifeWatch project. And LifeWatch is a European project which wants to create a virtual lab for biodiversity research, which means that it wants to integrate existing systems, it wants to bring together data from observatories, databases, web services, and so on. Now, key here is that it's virtual. It doesn't mean that all the data systems, all the information need to be at one institute. Um, IT technologies can do a lot of things, so we can communicate with databases at the other end of the world and still offer a good service uh, to people. One of the things that uh, is being done within LifeWatch is the creation of a taxonomic backbone. And that backbone is there to facilitate the standardization of species data. Not only taxonomy, but it also looks at occurrences, literature and ecology. So the five major components are listed here. And um, what you could see or could uh, know is that species registers, of course, will contain worms. Species occurrences will contain obis. So also here within LifeWatch, there's a very clear link between the taxonomy and the distributions. Okay. Now, worms itself is considered the taxonomic backbone for OBIS, which means that all the names within OBIS are being matched to worms, or at least we try to match them to worms. If no match is found within worms, then we're going to look at uh, some additional databases. And if necessary, we're going to contact our taxonomic editors to see if this uh, specific name is valid or not and might be missing from worms or not. Um, we've run some, um, what do you say, we've, we've done a big exercise in the last couple of years to catch up with all the non-matching names from OBIS. And this exercise started in December 2012. At that specific point, we had 35,000 names in OBIS that could not be matched uh, to worms. And uh, all these names have been taken through that matching process that you saw on the previous slides. Um, we're doing pretty good, but we're not there yet. It's a very long and very slow process uh, to go through. The good thing is, from those 35,000, there's more than 70% that we've already been managed either to match with worms or explain why it is not in worms. Uh, sometimes terrestrial species end up in marine data sets. We won't necessarily add that terrestrial species to worms. Um, worms and obis can also be used as a mutual geographical quality control. What I mean by that is that um, what you see here is a specific um, sea urchin species and the colors on the map show the distribution that is documented in worms. So distribution information coming from literature and from experts. What we can do is map the distributions from obis on top of that in a gridded format. So putting those two together gives um, either users or taxonomic experts an indication of how complete and how correct both systems are. And what we noticed here is uh, this one, which is an OBIS, but which fell out of the distribution information that we had in Worms. So that's a reason to look into this in more detail. Uh, we contacted our taxonomic uh, editor for that specific species and he could confirm that the record in OBIS is actually a misidentification because that specific species has never appeared in the Red Sea. So there's options um, to, uh, to quality control both systems that way. Is there any questions on this part of worms, Tim? So <laughs> how do you mark that record as being uh, incorrect? You know, is it still in OBIS? It's still in OBIS because we know that it's incorrect. Um, I think chances are high in OBIS that it is flagged as an outlier based on the quality control procedures, which I'll explain later. Um, but as Wart indicated earlier, it's impossible for us or it's not allowed for us to actually change that record in OBIS. What we need to do is go back to the original provider, point out that that is a mistake and ask him or her to correct that mistake and then give us the new data and then we can go from there. So I think in the end, 
Obis will still have some records that are incorrect, that can be flagged as incorrect, but that cannot be corrected because we cannot get back to the original provider.